Lord, we do have faith, but we want more. So we thank you for your promises. There's so many. The one on the table tonight is faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So, Lord, as your word goes forth, our prayer, our, your promise more so, is that our faith would grow, that we would see you more clearly, that we would hear you more clearly, and the world would see you in us more clearly. Father, that's our prayer. We ask it in the name of Jesus and every saint said, amen. amen. You may be seated. One of the incredible stories of Scripture is the two men on the road to Emmaus that are walking along the road, and of course, Jesus incognito comes up, and they, they're talking to him, they're hearing him, but they don't know it's him. Jesus is in front of them, but they don't see Jesus, right? They have some form of dialogue, communication, relationship, but it's not intimate, and it's not clear on the, where the relationship stands. How many people are like that today, right? Jesus is right there in front of them, but they don't see him, right? The Apostle Paul was someone who, when he met Jesus, he went blind. You know the story. He's like your Hannibal Lecter of the synagogue, right? Running after trying to kill Christians, men, women, and children. Slaughtered them. And he's on that road, man, to Damascus. He's heading to kill some more. And Jesus shows up right in front of him. And while he sees Jesus, he becomes blind to the world. Paul used to be Saul, was someone who had eyes to see Jesus. Not everyone does. The Apostle Paul, talking about seeing Jesus, and you don't need to turn there, talking about the incredible ministry of, of the new covenant, of being children of light and eyes to see the glorious gospel. He says, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not steadily look at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil unlifted in reading the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Man, when you turn to Jesus, and I don't mean in the physical realm, but in the spiritual, you turn to him, the veil is taken away, and you see him who's been standing there all along. Your whole life, the Lord's been standing there wanting to come in, wanting to sup, wanting to hang, wanting to have partnership, friendship, intimacy with you, but you didn't see him, you didn't hear him, but one day that veil was removed. The apostle Paul here, he's talking about Israel. He says, Israel to this day, the Mashiach, the anointed one, he's standing right there in front of the bride, right there in front of Israel, knocking, and they're reading the scripture, the word is going forth, and they com they're completely blind. They don't see him. Just like the two guys in the road to Emmaus walking along, Jesus is right there, and they don't even see. It's the Lamb of God with holes in his hands, in his feet, and his side pierced for their sin. And they're interested in spiritual things. You know that by reading the story. But they're still blind. Wow. To this day, Israel is still blind. Isn't that amazing to me? I mean, here, we're about to go to... Israel here in three months, which I can't wait, you know. I'm excited. Part one of going there for the first time and part two, a trip with Ty where I can bug him for two weeks straight, nonstop. You know, I got all kinds of little tricks I'll set up for him. It's going to be a little blast. <laughs> but I'm thinking about going to Israel and walking this land and going, wow, I'm here in the garden where Jesus sweat drops of blood and Golgotha and all these things. And this is incredible. And here I'm amongst a people Israel, and they don't know who Messiah is. They don't know who Jesus is, a large part. Paul, writing to the Christians in Rome, 
he goes on to talk a little bit in Romans chapter 11. He says, I did not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise on your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Paul says, right now, Israel, this nation, they're blind. They just, you can talk to them about Messiah, but the best you can possibly get is, he was a good person. You know, that's about it. You're not going to get, he was the Lamb of God. He was the fulfillment of the blood over the doorpost in Egypt. He's the Passover Lamb. He's what Isaac symbolized, the son that was sacrificed for the sin. They don't get it. Blind to it. Maybe some of you here today, you might say, well, I'm not blind. I see Jesus. Do you know that you can be saved and still go through periods of time where there's like a spiritual blindness where you don't see Jesus moving in your life? You know what I mean? I mean, that's kind of like it's implied with the Christians in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 where they, they lost their first love. You know, they, they loved Jesus. They had this passionate love affair with him. It was incredible. It was a fire moving in that church, man. It was like New York City in Asia Minor in Turkey. It was like, wow. But they, got, they, got so, they started to love the ministry in Ephesus more than the person they were ministering to. You see? They, it got, well, it got religious. And Jesus came and said, if you don't repent, turn around and get back to the priority and put your eyes back on the Messiah, I'm going to remove your lampstand. You're going to be walking around the walls. It'll be like you can't see anymore. Jesus didn't say, I'll leave you. Of course not, because he'll never leave us or forsake us. How good is the Lord, right? But that doesn't mean that, it, that we can't take our eyes off of him and put it on something else at him, and, and we become well, blind. Man, how do we combat that? How do we keep that from happening? What's our responsibility? Because it is a covenant, you know. It is God completing the work that he begun in us. It is him who's able to keep us from falling. It is him who will not let anyone pluck us out of his hand. But we also know we're supposed to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. It's both, amen? So how do we find ourselves not sliding back to somewhat of a, a slumber, a spiritual blindness where all of a sudden at one point, the veil was torn and removed, but now all of a sudden, it'd be kind of like this, standing there in the holy place for you seasoned saints, standing in the holy place, and you're there, and one day, all of a sudden, from top to bottom, the veil is torn, and now you can see the glory of God, and it's incredible. The veil has been removed. Your sight has been just given to you, and you see, and you're, you're, you're in awe, you're in wonder. And then, at time, from your swaying, from moving around, praising God, you found yourself doing this. And you're turning, and now you're not looking at the glory of God. You're not seeing him anymore. It's almost like you created your own veil. You're, you're looking at something else. Maybe you're looking at the table of showbread, and you're thinking more about fellowship with, with people than with him. Or maybe you're looking at the lampstand. You're thinking more about the gifts of the Spirit than you are his presence and his glory and his person and the blood and the mercy seat. It's something of him, but it's not him, though. You see the difference, right? We got to really be careful to keep our eyes on Jesus to where we recognize him at all times. We're not looking for things from him. We're looking to him. We're not looking to a church. We're looking to him. We're not looking to a pastor. We're looking to the pastor. All times. Now, see, you might be here tonight and go, yeah, that happens to me. I see sometimes in worship, there's somebody worshiping. I see tears flowing in their eyes. And, man, I hear them talk about how time disappears. Personally, I get bored. And I don't, you know, I, I'd like to see Jesus like that person seeing Jesus. But, <sighs> Help. <laughs> you ever been there? You just go through a season like, I want to see Jesus. I want to experience him. I want to hear him. I want to feel his power. I want to have his presence just so thick. It just, it's captivating. I want you to know he wants that for you more than you could ever possibly want it from him. And he's willing to help you tonight if you're at a place going, that's what I want. I want to go from walking with him but not really recognizing it's him to the place where after he disappeared, they stood there and they went, oh man, when our hearts burning within us when his word spoke, it was Jesus. It was him. And just had that first love flame again. So whether it is tonight, you don't, you've never really walked with Jesus. You've never really had that intimacy with him. Maybe dad and mom have had it. Maybe you're here tonight because dad and mom made you come. But check it out. They might have made you come, but the Lord's the one that made them made you come. Right? That's for you middle schoolers tonight. Glad you're here tonight. So, you ready to learn how all this works? 
This is going to be fun tonight. All right. So, chapter 42, before we look at chapter 42 and we pick up in the story of Joseph, who is our Old Testament type of Jesus, there is no better type and typology of Jesus than the story of Joseph. Well, Joseph, picking up, looking at verse 57 of chapter 41, understand our context tonight. It says, all the countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because famine was severe in all the lands. You remember last week that our Jesus of the Old Testament, right, was exalted to right above Pharaoh, like second in charge above the father, so to speak. And everything that was provided, everything that was given, everything that was created, if you would, was through the second, through the son, through the the savior, right? And so here we see this famine comes in the land as Joseph prophesied through a dream that God gave him, remember? Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. So now the seven years of plenty, they've come and gone. And boy, don't they come and go quickly, right? And now the famines come in. Nothing will make you look to see the Savior or the provision or the answer more than when things dry up. How often do you pray when there's plenty? It's when you are lacking, when you're not sure where the answer is, where the provision's coming, that all of a sudden, man, it's like the old saying, every atheist will pray in a foxhole or a lifeboat, right? Well, one of the ways God helps restore our sight to see who he is when it's blocked is when we're we're so sufficient of ourselves to provide, well, I can take care of myself, I can heal myself, I can go to the doctor. What happens when 10 doctors don't work? You might start praying. What happens when you lose your job and you can't find one? It's been a year that goes by. You might start praying. You might find out Jesus all along was waiting for you to call out to him, but you weren't because you had confidence in yourself, didn't you? So the Lord allows things to dry up and bring a famine to finally you go, we can't fix this. We can't resolve this. We need help, right? So now we're up this place where the famine's coming to the land and it's moved throughout Canaan. Egypt moved into Canaan and we've got Jacob and the sons of Israel, if you would, in a time of famine. Where we pick up where it says, when Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? And he said, Indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us, that that we may live and not die. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. Let's stop there. So here we have, guys, Jacob is saying, We're going to pretty much die, and you guys are standing around and doing nothing. It's kind of like, you know, hello, McFly, what are you doing? You're standing there, we're going to die. There's grain, there's bread, there's corn, there's Egypt. Go do it. Go do something to provide for us. Now, we see this number 10 that's interesting that is sent down to Egypt to go buy grain. This number of 10. He could have sent 11 because he had 11 sons left, right? We know the 12th, he had two sons. Well, the 10 sons were from Leah, and Jacob had two sons from Rebekah, right? One was Joseph, which they assume is dead, and the other one was Benjamin, the, the little one, little, little Benji. And so Jacob decides to send the ten down to Egypt to buy grain, but he keeps little Benji, the last son of his beloved Rachel, with him. When I read this, I just go, Lord, this is so amazing. Here you've got your people that are desperate for bread, And they're sending this number that represents the law to go buy bread. Now, for those of you that have already read ahead many times, you know the story. Their money doesn't buy them anything, does it? Listen closely to this verse that some of you are familiar with. In Isaiah 55, it says, Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend money on what is not bread and wages on what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of 
David, speaking of the son of David or the Messiah, messianic promise right here. I mean, I want you guys to think about the picture and shadow of the gospel we're seeing here. The people of God hear of there's a place where they can go get bread. Their approach to trying to get bread, the bread of life to save their life, is through 10 people going to pay for it with their own money. But the scripture speaks of the way we find mercy and deliverance. And understand, this is one of the things that will open your eyes when you're trying to see Jesus. If you're trying to see him by earning it, by paying for it, by thinking, if I do, I'll get satisfied, I'll get provided for, you'll be disappointed. But if you're going to come to Jesus, the Savior, the only one who has bread that will satisfy, you've got to come saying, Lord, I'm coming to buy with no money. What I'm going to get from you, I can't get of anything to deserve it from what I've done or who I am or what I know or who I belong to. I don't deserve anything. See, many times that's why people are blind. That's why the Jews, Israel, are blind to the Messiah because they're still trying to approach him with 10 people. They're still trying to approach him with 10 commandments. Well, okay, I gotta be a good Jew. I can't kill, I can't murder, I can't covet my neighbor's donkey, I mean his Corvette. I can't covet my neighbor's wife. I can't lie, I can still get cheat. I can't, yeah, I, can't, I, I, I just, oh, got all these rules. Oh, over 600 rules, what can I do? I'm trying to figure out what I can do and not do so somehow I can see the Messiah. See, there's a lot of Jews still waiting to see their Messiah. Their Joseph, if you would, to come and provide in this famine, this ungodly world. But they're trying to approach him based on the Ten Commandments and the law. You'll never see the Messiah like that. You only see Messiah when you come and say, the only thing that's going to satisfy me is something that I could never buy with money. And they're about to learn that lesson. Because they haven't learned it yet, they're going to be standing right and looking right at Joseph, this type of Jesus, and oblivious that it's him. Like a lot of people that go to church, they come to church and they sing a song and they read their Bible, Jesus is right there, the spirit of the drive right there, but they don't hear anything. They don't sense anything. You want to know why? Because they're coming in the number of 10. They're coming under law. You'll never sense, you'll never hear, you'll never experience anything. You'll be one of those people that sit there and go, Dave sure talks a long time. Man, you know? That's what you'll do. You might do that anyway. <laughs> but, but you get my point. It's got to be by grace. Eyes that see Jesus are eyes that are fed up with trying to earn his voice, earn his touch, earn his favor, earn the bread of life that satisfies. And make no mistake about it, that's the only thing that satisfies you know, marriage doesn't satisfy, career doesn't satisfy, money doesn't satisfy, your good health doesn't satisfy. The only thing that satisfies is Jesus. Everything else is temporary. Well, these boys are about to learn that, and it's an incredible story over the next three weeks that we're going to spend some time getting some deep revelation with. Verse 4, Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, lest some calamity befall him. Many commentators spectate that Jacob didn't quite believe Reuben and Simeon's story about Joseph, that some wild animal ate him. He had his suspicions, no doubt. He was not about to trust Reuben and Simeon, the boys, with his young little Benji. He wasn't about to. So clearly, and it, again, it's speculation, but I think it's got some sound clout to it, Jacob was carrying something in his heart. That could be you tonight. Verse 5, it says, And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now, Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brother came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them. But he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Stop there. Here these guys have come, it says, to buy bread. And now they stand before the Savior of the world, so to speak, 
If you're going to live, then you're going to get food from Joseph. Otherwise, you will die. May I just point out that unless anyone comes to Jesus Christ for salvation, you will die in your sin. There is no other Savior. There is no other way to heaven. There's not turnpike to heaven, 95 to heaven. You know, there's only one way, okay? Don't listen to anyone else because anyone's lying to you. Jesus said he was the only way, so either he was a, a lunatic, a liar, or he's Lord, amen? So I say he's Lord. Do you agree with that? So here they're coming and going, okay, there's, we've been told about this guy Joseph. There's only, we're going to die unless we get sustenance and bread. And, and we're told there's only one guy to go to. There's only one Messiah to go to, and we need to go to him. Well, it's been about eight or nine years since, well, Joseph has been made, roughly about eight years that he's been reigning, you know, in this authority there in the kingdom. I've always wondered reading this story, why through those eight or nine years that Joseph didn't like send word to Jacob, his dad. Send uh, an assassin for Simeon, <laughs> you know, something, you know, just to go after these. He, he just, he hung. Again, it's all speculation because we don't know why. We, we want to, you know, be silent with the Bible silent, but it's kind of fun to talk about and think about. I mean, when we look at the character of Joseph throughout the rest of the story, pretty righteous. So it doesn't lend toward any type of understanding that maybe he was just bitter or in denial or something like that. No, this guy is a pretty righteous dude. He's the only one besides Daniel throughout the scripture we see no mention of sin in their lives. We know they were a sinner because only Jesus was without sin, right? But Man, just so righteous, so full of love and grace, which again we see. But he waited on the Lord. He waited on the Lord to move. In chapter 37, he was 17 years old, some 22 years later, but, but 17 years old, and he has this vision of his father, mother, brothers bowing down before him. That's exactly what we saw happen in verse 6 and 7. It says, here it is, 22 years later, fulfillment of the vision. His brothers are bowing down before him. What that must have been like. To get this vision from God of what's going to happen, and you're seeing it all come to pass with dreams and visions and all these things taking place, and now you're standing there. And there they are. And what is, how does he handle it? How would you handle it? Off with his head, right? I mean, come on, we've all got Simeons and Rubens in our life who have thrown us in a pit and sold us off to slavery, right? I mean, there's not a week that goes by I don't get someone to slander me or do something. Every week, it's something. Today, I get slandered by somebody that I don't even know who they are. <laughs> I'm like, what's this about, Lord? This is weird. There's always some opportunity to reveal to me if I have eyes to see Jesus. Because if my eyes are on Jesus, then I realize it's not really me who's being betrayed or slandered. It's Christ in me. It's not me. It ain't about me. It ain't about you. Now, you can hear that intellectually and go, yeah, amen, far out. But it's, you really know what's in your soul when God allows a Simeon or a Reuben or a Judas, a Jezebel, someone in your life where you just go, wow. And then it sits for a while, and, and you think you got over it. Because you prayed the prayer, oh, Lord, I forgive them. I forgive them like God and Christ forgave me, and amen. And then all of a sudden, years go by, and something out of nowhere. You're having a great day. It's wonderful. The grain's flowing in the midst of a famine. God, you're so good for providing. Thank you. And all of a sudden, who do you see there in the aisle at Publix? Man. Right? Who... Or maybe it, maybe you're having a great week with your spouse. It's wonderful, but all of a sudden, one day, their blood sugar's low. <laughs> Our ladies, it's that time, right? Things that happen. The kid's acting like a maniac, and the wife's stressed out, and it's all your fault, you idiot. What happened? How did I go from the grain is flowing to the devil is right in front of me? Right? That's what it feels like. Could that be the Lord trying to show you, if, do you have eyes to see Jesus? These boys did not. 
The type of Savior was right there. Now, granted, last time they saw Joseph, he was covered in dirt in a pit and then pulled up out of that pit after being in there for a day and sold off to a slave, and he was 17. Now he's a grown man, so no doubt he looks a little bit different than when they knew him. But Joseph, being this type of Jesus, it says that, well, we read that it says that he, he, he acted like a stranger, and it said he spoke roughly to him. Now, some people interpret this roughly meaning to be in another language. And I've heard teachings of that. It doesn't line up in the Hebrew. That's real. No, he was just hardcore with them. He acted like a stranger, like he didn't know him. No doubt he looked like a stranger in his Egyptian garb and, and you know, the, 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 ice, the ice scarab and all, all the things going on. He's, and he's standing there speaking another language with an interpreter, and he's hardcore with them accusing them, as we'll read, of being spies in the land to come and steal their grain. Why does he speak so roughly to them? Why doesn't he just go, guys, it's me. Why sometimes when we have a hard time seeing who the Lord is in our life, through our life, providing in our life, answering our prayers, why doesn't he answer him right away? Why doesn't he reveal himself right away? Why doesn't he do it like we tell him to? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, but I know he does it, does he? He does it his way, and he does it in ways that really test us. Have you ever thought, man, God, you're kind of harsh sometimes? I mean, you wicked, adulterous generation, how much longer must I bear with you, he says to his disciples. How much longer may I bear with you? That doesn't sound like gentle, loving Jesus, does it? Sometimes... Jesus has to come not just as the lamb, but the lion, because it's what we need to remove the scales from our eyes. Hebrews chapter 12, quoting from the Psalms, the writer says, Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. It didn't say comforted, it said rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Well, that's not, that's not sweet, loving, compassionate Jesus that I know. My Jesus wouldn't talk to me like that. If that's what you need, you better believe he will. Not because he's mad at you, because he realizes that's what you need. See, Jesus wants sincere relationship with you, a genuine, organic relationship with you. See, if Joseph would have been like, hey, guys, it's me. I didn't die. Joseph, all right, buddy. Right? We, guys, we got it made. He's not mad at us. He loves us. This is awesome. Would their hearts have changed? No. This type of Jesus is going, they, they have to go through some things. There's some layers that have to be torn off. There's some surgery and recovery time and things that have to take place before there's a true healing. Sometimes we need to be rebuked. Sometimes we need to be told our Christianity is a joke. And we need to turn from our sin and stop justifying it because we were saved by grace. We can do whatever we want. It's okay. God still loves me. That's not the point. See, because when we start choosing the things of the world and we start choosing law over grace and we get caught up and deceived, what happens is we take our eyes off Jesus and this layer, this thickness just comes over us and, and it blocks us from connection with the Savior, even though we're saved. You'll, you'll never lose your salvation if you're really saved, that is, but you definitely can lose fellowship. You can lose your peace. When the Holy Spirit's grieved, you will lose your peace, and then God will be moving in your midst in the person's life right next to you, and you'll be blind to it. You won't even see it's him. So what happens next? The Lord might have to get a little rough with you. The Lord has gotten rough with me many times. And I am convinced, as my father used to say when he pulled out that paddle that looked like the Titanic, and it sounded like a freight train, son, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. I hated when you said that, by the way. <laughs> I thought it was one of the stupidest things I could ever hear in my life, right? Some of you are going, who's he talking to? I'm talking to my dad. He's here. How about that? 
it, but, but I, I get it now. Having raised four kids and they're all adults now, it's like, I, okay, I get it. So how much more does Papa God go, I'm gonna have to get rough with you and I want you to know it's not because I'm angry at you. You're gonna feel that way because you're blinded by sin and selfishness and flesh and legalism. And so you're gonna interpret it as harsh. It's not that way. When Jesus, oh man, I love this scripture in Mark chapter 11 where Jesus comes in to the temple courts and is turning over, right? The tables, wait a minute, you're turning my house into a market. Now the Pharisees, they wanted to see how they could kill him, right? But the people would go, this guy rocks. This is exactly what we need, right? But he was really adamant and strong and rough about it. And, and this, this verse really just blows me away. Chapter uh, 11, verse 15 of Mark, it says, When he came to Jerusalem, Jesus went to the temple, began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and t- overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Wares meaning an item that I can sell and get gain for it. Jesus got rough with people trying to have monetary gain in the house of God as a mean of spiritual enlightenment or worship. I will not accept that, and I'm going to get rough that you're trying to do that. My bread doesn't cost anything. It's free. You could never earn enough to pay for it. Stop thinking you can. And some people are so bent on legalism and trying to earn acceptance with God in a place of prominence in the church of Jesus Christ. Well, i gotta, I got to tag deacon dumbbell, dinkin, you know, I, I, I got this. And they're walking around with 10 guys in their pocket going, I'm looking to buy something. You do that long enough, Jesus is going to come into your temple. He's going to turn over the tables. He's going to get that out of your hand right now. You can't buy this. And you're going to feel it's harsh. You're going to feel it's rough. It's the Lord giving you what I like to call an intention getter. It's coming not from the lamb, but from the lion. I think we see a picture of that here with Joseph, and it's amazing. Verse 9, then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about and said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, no, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. We are honest men. Uh Uh-huh. Your servants are not spies. We are honest men. (laughs) For two, over two decades, these guys have left good old dad in depression with his precious Joseph in that coat of sleeves with blood all over it from one of his lambs that they slaughtered, thinking my son was murdered, eaten alive. But we're honest men. One of the things that will blind you from seeing Jesus, boy, is denial. Denial. It's been so many years, no doubt they had forgotten about Joseph. Well, they're getting a reminder today in our study. But they're actually believing. Do you know you can tell yourself something about yourself so much that you actually believe it? I mean, I don't know how many times it would take for me to look in the mirror and go, you're Arnold Schwarzenegger, you're Arnold Schwarzenegger, you're Arnold Schwarzenegger, you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, how many times would I have to do that before I actually believed it and got that delusional, right? But the mind's an amazing thing how often we can tell ourselves something where we actually start to believe it. Oh, I'm a good Christian. I'm a good person. Well, maybe next to Charles Manson, you're a good person. But let me tell you what, lined up with what the Bible calls good, you're a filthy, wretched sinner, treacherous to the bone, and you deserve eternal damnation. Don't you feel good about you? (laughs) Now, see, when you start looking at it like that, you go, I'm not honest, I'm not... My throat's an open grave. Are you kidding me? I even lied to myself. I'm in denial of areas of things where I've transgressed God's law and broken his heart and betrayed his trust and his people, and that's after I got saved. There is nobody good but God. There's nobody truly honest but God. But these guys are so far in denial, and that's one of the things that blinds us to seeing the presence of God and the glory of God moving and seeing the torn veil in his glory and going to a table of communion, you know, and seeing the blood and the mercy seat and it impacting you where it just breaks your heart. Why? Because there's areas of denial where you actually think you're something outside of God, that you deserve something because you did a good deed or you prayed a prayer with somebody. No. 
you're slowly slipping back under the Ten Commandments when you start thinking like that. But the terrible tragedy of it all is you don't get to see Jesus. He might be right there, but you're not seeing him. They're oblivious, completely oblivious. Verse 12, but he said to them, no, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, your servants are 12 brothers. Now, they could have, he could have said 11, right? Could have totally just blew off the life of Joseph, but the life of little Joseph the teenager is represented here in their words. Noteworthy. The sons of one man in the land of Canaan, and in fact, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. Now, again, it is noteworthy because they could have said, we are 11 sons of one man. No, there's 12. And we're thinking about him about right now. Maybe they have grown in honesty. Maybe there's part of them that's desiring truth in the most inward part. Verse 14, it says, But Joseph said to them, It is as I spoke to you, saying you are spies. Man, he's just taking them through it, isn't he? In this manner you shall be tested. Hmm. By the life of of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. So many speculate that Joseph was concerned, rightfully so, because Benjamin being his little brother, the only brother from his mother, Rachel, probably was concerned they got rid of him as well out of jealousy. So in a human realm, it's possible that, that Joseph's questionable and concerned and curious what's going on. One way to find out. Verse 16, send one of you and let him bring your brother. You shall be kept in prison that your words may be tested to see whether you are any, there's any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So we put them all together in prison three days. Then Joseph said to them, the third day, do this and live for I fear Ra." Or at Isis? No. They would think he'd say an Egyptian god here. He doesn't. Wait, this is like second to Pharaoh, and he used the word Elohim. This Egyptian just said to us, he fears Elohim. That's, that's our God. And then he says something here, this type of Jesus, this type of Messiah, says that on the third day, do not do this and live. Could that be a reference to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Maybe. Verse 15, excuse me, verse 19, it says, If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, but you go and carry grain for the famine of your houses and bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, "Mm, We are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Stop there. Wow. Here we see a light bulb going off, a light switch, a little bell. All of a sudden in their head, they're going, remember how we hardened our hearts to the cry of Joseph? The one that we were to one day destined bow down to? All, even creation, the sun and the moon would bow down to him. And we hardened our hearts. And we betrayed him and we sold him for silver. He was thrown into a prison. But he brought freedom to the prisoners. And here now, we're standing before him and we can remember his cries. Do you know that there'll be a day where for some people it will be too late. There'll be an eternity and they'll remember Zechariah even talks about that there'll be a day where Israel will remember the one that they pierced. They'll remember. Caiaphas will remember, my God, my God, why have you forsaken Caiaphas? The Roman soldiers, they'll remember, Jesus, forgive them, Father. They'll remember. It will pierce them. It's better to be pierced with that now than in eternity, amen? 
to know that there are times like even tonight, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you haven't really truly seen him, you've heard of him, dad and mom talk about him, your spouse talks about him, but you haven't seen him. You haven't acknowledged him. You haven't had intimacy with him. Tonight will be one of those nights you can remember going, I remember you knocking, Lord. I remember, remember your word. There was a burning in my heart and, and, and I was wrestling with it. I'll tell you, moments like that can come back to either bless you or curse you. Right now, the jury is still out. Verse 22, and Reuben answered them saying, did I not speak to you saying, do not sin against the boy and you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them for he spoke to them through an interpreter. So here we have Joseph sitting back. They think he can't speak Hebrew. That's really cool. Oh, I love it. Joseph is just sitting there listening to these guys argue. Oh, my gosh. Remember when he was crying out, little, little Joseph, little Joe, you know, he, he's quite, oh, what did we have done? And, and, and Joseph is just sitting there going, this is incredible, God. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I have a hard time between crying and laughing or at the same time, you know. Like, this is, this is, God, you're funny. You're good. Thank you, Lord. This is wonderful. But here they're downcast, and then Reuben. Who likes an I told you so? Anybody? That's Reuben, the oldest. I told you we shouldn't do this, remember? And he was, Reuben was the politician. He wanted to be right with Simeon, who was, well, kind of the leader of the demonic pack, so to speak. And Reuben was the oldest, who was kind of like, well, I, I don't want to get my brothers mad at me, but this is not right, and, and Reuben was just always conflicted. He, again, was your spiritual politician. And so here he is trying to play both sides. Do you know you'll never see Jesus trying to play both sides? You might go, hey, well, at least he did stand up for Joseph. I mean, he did do that back early in the book, and he is correct in what he's saying. Yeah, but he's got a half heart of devotion to God. Real devotion will cost you something. It'll cost you family. It'll cost you money. It'll cost you your, your dignity. Can you lose your dignity for God? Will you lose your dignity for God? Are you willing to? Reuben was not. But he wanted to act it like he was something. Let me tell you what. That's why Jesus said either be hot or cold, not lukewarm, not political, not in between. Jesus said that makes me more sick than if you were like Simeon. Whew, what a word. Well, verse 24, it says, and he turned himself away from them, wow, and wept. Just like Jesus looked on Israel, Jerusalem, and he wept. Remember that, folks? Mm. Then he turned to them again, and he talked with them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Stop there, Simeon. Take note of this for students of the Bible. Simeon means hearing. Hearing. The word has went forth, and now he's going to send them away. You ready? Without hearing. Now, this is prophetic to say the least. I want you to listen to this scripture. You might remind this. Some, some of you men might kind of remember this from our study through the Gospels as we're going through a rapid overview, where Jesus quoted this from Isaiah, where Isaiah 6 Verse 8 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom shall for us go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. And he, and he said, Go and tell this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. Stop there. Now, I know some of you hear something like that in Isaiah and the Gospels and go, Lord, I'm confused. I, I've read that before where he quotes Isaiah, and he says, I speak in perils because if they really understood, they might actually hear what I'm saying and see what I'm saying, and they might get saved. But Jesus, isn't that good? Now, some of our Reformed brothers that are hardcore five-point Calvinists will go, well, that's because we have vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor, you know? And so he's just guarding the truth from those vessels of dishonor because it's not his will that they get saved. So he speaks in parables. 
I say hogwash to that. Hogwash. It's God's will that no one would perish. Okay? The blood of Christ was shed for the whole sins of the whole world, 1 John. So, with that said, then Lord, why are you speaking in parables? And why do you say that you speak in parables? Some, some people don't hear or see with their ears or with their eyes. Because it's kind of like Peter. Jesus asked Peter, he said, Peter, you know, guys, who do men say I am? Well, some say you're Jeremiah because you weep a lot, and some say you're Elijah because you've got really rock on power, and some say you're John the Baptist because you're always talking about repenting. Jesus is like, well, who do you say I am? And not, not flesh and blood, who, do you, who does the Spirit say I am? Oh, I, the Spirit says that you're the Christos, the anointed one, the only priest and king and prophet that can be anointed three in one. You're the, you're the one, you're the Mashiach, you're the Messiah. Oh, I says, man, that wasn't because someone told you. That wasn't intellectual, Peter. That was spiritual. And Jesus would speak in parables because it was a revelation. Because, see, check it out. People wanted to follow Jesus because, well, hey, I got an aunt that's dead that needs to be raised. I wanna, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm really hungry. I want to follow Jesus. My dad is sick. Well, I'll follow Jesus. But you know, my crop's burned up. I'm going to follow Jesus like a lot of people are today. I need help, God. I need, a, I need a boyfriend. Help me, God. Right? Weird stuff. But check it out. In the same way, this is such a picture and prophetic parallel of parables that we see, where Joseph could have, in the same way, said, hey, guys, it's me. We're family. Move on in the palace, which ultimately that's what happens, right? But check it out. He says, no, there has to be a change of the heart. It has to be spiritual. And so I'm going to send them away without Simeon, without hearing. It can't be something hearing with their ears. It has to be something in the spirit that changes them. I can't intimidate them. I can't manipulate them. Now, he could have. He could have. In the same way, the Lord could just show up to every person on earth and like a flash of lightning come and everybody would go, he must be God. Okay, that's not what the Lord wants. It has to be real. So he speaks in parables. He removes the flesh, the hearing of the flesh. It needs to be spiritual, revealed from the spirit of your Father in heaven. Matthew 16, read it. It's powerful. Again, I could be way off there, but that's what I get out of it. So you, you pray about that. Verse 25, then Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks with grain and restore every man's money to his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. So they loaded their donkeys with the grain and departed from there. But as one of them opened the sack to give the donkey feed at the encampment, he saw his money, and there it was, in the mouth of his sack. So he said to his brothers, my money has been restored, and there it is, in my sack. Then his heart, their hearts failed, and they were afraid, saying to one another, what is this that God has done to us? Then they went to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, and told him all about what had happened to them, saying, This man who is lord of the lands spoke roughly to us and took us the spies of the country. But we said to him, We are honest men, and we are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. Then the man the Lord of the country said to us, by this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine of your land, of your households, and be gone. And bring your youngest brother to me, so I shall know that you are not spies and that you are honest men. I will grant your brother to you, and you will trade in the land. Then it happened. As they emptied their sacks, there surprisingly each man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they were their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob their father said to them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. So he's convinced Simeon is dead as well. And you want to take Benjamin? All things are against me. Clinically depressed, no doubt. Verse 37, then Reuben spoke to his father saying, kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hand and I will bring him back to you. 
But he said, my son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he is left alone. If any calamity shall befall him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Stop there. We're going to close here tonight in the story and pick up next week, but in closing, there are 10 men that are carrying a load of guilt and shame. It's blinded them to see that Joseph was right in front of them. One of the first things that they needed to do in the picture of the Bible, what we see here of eternal life, is they're called to learn something. The call to learn that the bread of life comes not by money you have, it comes freely. And here we see this picture here of provision of bread being given to the children, the chosen of God, governed by God, and their money is back. Now, it scares them, the thought of, wow, we've got bread that we didn't pay for. This scares us. This isn't right. This is twilight zone. We're fearful for our lives. He already thinks we're spies. Now we're, they're going to think we're thieves. The thought of it being a gift is something that just was alien to them. A lot of Christians are like that. God's going to bless me and provide for me and love me just because he loves me. But what did I do? Nothing. He just loves you. You've got to get over that hurdle. But one of the things that keeps us from getting over that hurdle, you ready? Is we carry guilt and shame. When you carry guilt and shame for your previous transgressions, it will blind you to the beauty of grace. It will. You might say, well, Dave, I'm over that. I got saved. Let me tell you what. There's still layers of guilt and shame for past sins you've done that God is still working your salvation out through you and in you and removing lies about who he is and who you are in him. It's a process we're going through. Amen? And a big part of that are the lies about how he sees our past sins. And the more that we hold on to them, they're like cancer, man. They're like cancer. This psalm that we're going to close in, Psalms 32, was written concerning the life of David, King David, after his sin with Bathsheba and her past husband, Uriah. Psalms 32, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man who the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in the spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Stop there, may have your attention. David looks back and he says, I can remember when I had the guilt of the adultery and the murder and the stain and the shame and I carried it like ate at my bones. There has been medical journals in past years that have talked about, man, if we could just have a pill that would remove guilt, these mental wards would just be emptied. Do you know that? Because the majority of sickness and mental illness comes from guilt and shame that we carry. It's a demonic camping ground for the enemy because it's so anti-Christ, anti-gospel. It's where the demonic likes to dwell. So the more that you carry around guilt and shame, let me tell you what, it eats away even at your physical body. I'm not going to try and say everyone who's got a sniffle or a cough, demon, demon, demon. No, we have bodies that are frail, that, you know, that we're groaning inwardly, longing for redemption. These bodies are dying. They're going back to the dust where they came from. I get that. But we're also in a war. And the enemy does inflict physical illness on us. And that is part of the warfare we're in. And what invites that is when we carry guilt and shame, which basically we're saying the blood wasn't enough. The blood was enough to get me saved. After I got saved, things that I'm doing, ah, I need more sacrifice for that. You've been bewitched. That's what happens. And it eats away at you. Now, something that I was, I, I talked a little bit Saturday night. I said that, you know, 1 John 1, 9 and 10, real clear. Confession of sin, to have all of our sins forgiven, is something a Christian doesn't have to do anymore. You don't have to go to God and go, well, I need to confess my sin because it says for order for my sins to be forgiven, I have to confess my sin. I say that's not biblical. 
You confess one time for eternal life, and your sins are forgiven. You ne- if you're really saved, you never have to go again and go, oh, wow, okay, I, 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 am I up to confession? Are my dates up to confession? And some denominations raise people to believe that. I need to walk in the box and be up to my confession, otherwise my sins are forgiven, and I might have lost my salvation. No, when you're saved, your sins are forgiven past, present, and future. It's done. But just because they're forgiven, and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, doesn't mean there's not consequences for sin as a Christian. There's not consequences for holding on to the lie and guilt of shame as if God had not forgiven you. Listen to this verse right here. Psalms 32, verse 5, it says, I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Church, listen closely. We're running a couple minutes late. I promise you it's worth it. While we as believers don't have to go, yeah, I remember when I slandered my brother and I threw him a pit or I get a pit, I gossip, I slandered, I betrayed, I lied, I cheated, I, I did things I know that the Spirit of God was quitting me saying, no, don't go down that road, but I did it anyway. And, and I just kind of blew it off like, well, I'm fr- God loves me anyway. It's okay. <sighs> Something stirring, a little crack in there. Give the enemy an opportunity. But he's already forgiven me, so what does it matter? I mean, his grace is sufficient. You know, where sin abounds, grace abounds the more, right? Far out. We're all good. No, it's not good. If we don't confess our sins, even as James says, to one another, we don't find healing. Confessing your sin as a believer doesn't mean that I need to so God will forgive me Because if I don't, he hasn't, and then I'll go to hell when yesterday I would have went to heaven. That's crazy, kooky, weird, heretical. But this is true. When you don't confess your sin, and you don't acknowledge what's true and bind, guilty, loose, innocent, and you release truth and light in your life, you don't do that, what happens is the guilt of sin, it holds you down. It becomes a guilty conscience. It has nothing to do with your salvation. It has everything to do with your walk with Jesus today on planet Earth. Joseph could have just manipulated and controlled the whole thing after a couple of years in power and sent some chariots, bought everybody, hey, I forgive you, it's all good. Their hearts would have not been changed. They could have walked in and Joseph could have just said, hey, guys, it's me, I forgive you, wept as he will weep. But he was waiting for the right time. He could have and had a phony pseudo-repentance like many people do. They go forward, they pray a prayer, they shed shed a couple tears of of sadness, of remorse over that they're not happy. (laughs) It's not about their sin or they've hurt God. They're just unhappy that they're unhappy. And they pray a prayer and then they live a couple weeks, maybe even a couple months of self-righteousness. We'll call it behavior modification. It's not the righteous of Christ bleeding through their life. That's why it doesn't last. The Lord doesn't want that in anyone. He wants the real deal. That's why he speaks in parables. That's why revelation comes through spirit and not through flesh. And Joseph is waiting, allowing them to go through this process where the fallow ground on their heart is getting ripped and shredded where it becomes real. Where the guilt of their transgression is removed and they confess, and there is a weeping party that will go on in about three weeks that we'll read that will be be a dry eye in the place when we go through it. And I believe as we go through this, God is going to teach us about forgiveness. Now, you might have come tonight going, I thought I was coming to learn about how I can forgive that jerk who gave me a hard time last week. No, you came tonight to learn that you need to stop trying to buy bread with money. You hear me? You've got to start there. If you're having a problem with forgiveness, it's because you're having a problem understanding how you were forgiven. Because the more you understand how you were forgiven, forgiving becomes just a reflex. It's not work. No matter who slaps you in the face or steals your coat, you give them your shirt, it's just a reflex because you're so zoned in that the bread that you have, you never could have earned. The grace, the peace, the joy, all that you have, you never could have earned it. So how can you withhold passing it on? Freely you've received, you're going to freely give. I can't freely give until I really learn how that I haven't really learned how to freely receive. Let's pray. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, 
there is liberty. We all with unveiled face beholding as a mirror in the glory of the Lord are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. God, you are changing us from glory to glory. You're helping us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. Father, some say that grace is the beginning point. We believe it's the only point. It's your grace. Teach us, Lord, what the blood really means. What's your body that was torn and shred for our transgression, what it really means. Allow our hearts to be broken for that. We confess to you our self-righteousness, how we wrestle with you over your goodness, and how we hold on to shame of sin when you took it upon yourself on the cross. Teach us, Lord. Teach us how to receive provision and power and your presence simply because of who you are and what you've done. We pray these things, Father, and we ask them in the incredible name of Jesus. And every saint said, Amen. Family, God bless you. Let's have some fellowship.